Good evening and welcome to this third lecture in the 2017 University of Edinburgh Gifford Lecture Series. My name is Mark Harris. I teach science and religion here in the University of Edinburgh and I'm a member of the Gifford Lectureship Committee at the University. And of course it's my great privilege to welcome our eminent speaker, Professor Geoffrey Stout, who's Professor of Religion at Princeton University and he's continuing his series on the theme Religion Unbound ideals and powers from Cicero to King. And now this evening, Professor Stout will deliver his third lecture entitled, Why Religion, Faith and Freedom Proved Hard to Reconcile. Now the lecture and question time this evening are being recorded and the video will shortly be available on the University's Gifford Lectures web pages. And that leads me into an announcement that I've been asked to make um, following on from Tuesday's lecture, there was interference over the sound system. Those of you who are here, I'm sure, will have noticed. Um, the system has been thoroughly checked and adjusted and seems to be working well. Now, it may be that the microphones here were picking up some kind of interference from other wireless devices. So I've been asked if any unnecessary devices could be switched off during the lecture or put on flight mode or something like that. Um, if the issue persists, it is possible to move rooms for next week, but we're hoping that won't be necessary. So it's now my pleasure to hand you over to Professor Geoffrey Stout. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Professor Harris. And thanks also to the graduate students who uh, peppered me with good questions for a good deal of yesterday. It's a good time. Well, one aim of these lectures is to clarify an ideal of ethical religion, to trace its political history, and explain its survival in a supposedly secular age. Last time, while essaying a friar's charge, that the conquistadors were irreligious. I said quite a lot about religion, a little about freedom, but almost nothing about faith. And this evening I shall discuss controversies over all three of these concepts, topics, in the centuries leading up to 1800. Again, my antidote for anachronism is to look closely at how the key terms were actually used. And let's begin with religion's relation to faith. Nowadays, these topics are so often run together that the terms have become near synonyms. Native American, African, and Asian traditions that are sometimes classified as religious are also routinely called faiths. This dubious habit has something to do with Christianity's semantic status in many modern settings as the paradigmatic instance of religion. Given Christianity's cultural dominance in Europe and its role in spreading religion talk throughout the world in earlier centuries, how could it not be viewed for good and for ill as paradigmatically religious. The traditions that Christians originally classified as religious all resembled the Christian paradigm in some way. They engaged in divine worship, ritual sacrifice, devotional prayer, preaching, or cultivation of piety. One at least of those things, maybe more, uh, maybe all of them, but in each case, there were also dissimilarities. Christianity, like Islam, inherited from Judaism an explicit concern with faith that many traditions do not share. When Christians criticized what they called false religion, they often attributed deficient faith commitments to, tr to the traditions being criticized even when those traditions did not explicitly refer to anything like the virtue of faith as defined in Christian theology or in Christian, Jewish, and Muslim scriptures. We should therefore at least 
be as cautious with co cross-cultural application of the term faith as we are learning to be with the term religion. This warning applies, first of all, to our characterizations of ancient Rome, where religion talk uh, arose. Pre-Christian Rome was concerned with fides, just as pre-Christian Greece was concerned with pistis. Faith in this sense is fidelity to or trust in someone's promises, a covenant, one's people, platoon, or allies, one's father, spouse, friend, master, patron, monarch, a god, or oneself. Lucretius emphasized faith in one's own sense experience. Cicero and his follower Valerius Maximus encouraged Romans to have faith in their own reason or judgment. This is very close to the virtue that Emerson later called self-trust or self-reliance. In early Christian sources, all of these usages are present, but so is a scriptural notion of faith in God as a divinely given virtue. This is the conception of faith that Augustine attributed to St. Paul, endorsed in Book 5 of the City of God, and assumed in Book 19 of that work when judging pagan society to be bereft of true justice because bereft of true piety. True religion is associated here with piety. Both are virtues of acknowledged dependence, whereas the divine gift of faith enables someone, according to Augustine, to have trust in, belief in, and fidelity to the Christian God. Augustine did not equate religion and faith, but it was from the vantage of true faith, as he conceived of it, that he distinguished true religion from its semblances. So it's from the vantage of true faith, as he conceived it, that he distinguished true from false religion. But he wasn't thinking that faith and religion are exactly the same thing. So in this sense, faith had priority for him. Conformity to true faith was a necessary condition of true religion. Augustine, as I suggested last time, did not endorse using coercion to convert non-Christians to the true faith. He did, however, endorse using coercion to hold Christians to the promise of fidelity to Christian orthodoxy. Moving right along to the medieval period, uh, Thomas Aquinas treated religion and faith not only as distinct virtues, but as dis distinct kinds of virtue. He categorized religion as a moral virtue. Like all moral virtues on this conception, religion is acquired, according to Thomas, by repeated actions of the right kind. The formative function of repeatedly doing the same sort of thing helps explain the connection between this particular acquired, acquired virtue, religion, and ritual action. Like other virtues that he took to be annexed to justice, religion is required, on Thomas's view, to uh, set right our relationships to one another and to God. Now, in setting out his view, Thomas referred to Cicero as an authority on religion. So a pagan philosopher is repeatedly cited in his discussion of religion. And the reason for that is that a moral virtue is the sort of thing that a wise pagan philosopher concerned with the common good might know quite a lot about. <clears throat> 
Now, in contrast, Thomas called faith a theological virtue. The chief authority on faith and on its relation to religion is God's word as revealed in Holy Scripture and as interpreted in the teaching of church fathers, including very prominently St. Augustine. The virtue of faith is directly concerned with the intellect's assent to what God reveals. Faith is indirectly, but necessarily, also concerned with the will, because a perfected will is required to move the intellect to assent. Okay. Like Augustine, Thomas adopted the vantage of faith, as he understood it, when addressing how the virtues of faith and religion are related. Faith is a divine gift required to perfect the virtue of religion and its underlying natural inclination to relate oneself rightly to God. The gift, once offered, can be refused. Someone who refuses it or who first accepts it and then reneges exhibits the vice of infidelity, which is not exactly the same thing as the vice of irreligion or superstition because it's a defect in faith, not in religion. One species of infidelity is heresy. Whether something worth calling the virtue of religion as distinct from a sort of commendable religious striving can be present at all in pagans is a question Thomas did not answer clearly as far as I can tell. Las Casas skirted the question even when expressing cautious admiration of Amerindian religious practices and he does quite a bit of that. Savonarola, the other, uh, Dominic, one of the other Dominicans mentioned last time, was concerned about the presence of Jews and Muslims in Italy, but his ministry in F Florence in the 1490s was mainly directed against Christian heretics and what he took to be their sins of infidelity, sodomy, avarice, tyranny, and oppression. Because he, too, followed Augustine on the issue of coercion, he had no qualms about resort to force in his efforts to purify the church. Remember, coercion uh, on this view, on this Augustinian view, is okay to use uh, in order to bring back heretics into the fold. They've made their promises. <laughs> Now they can be held to them. That's the idea. Religion for these Dominicans, and keep in mind that Thomas and Savonarola and Las Casas are all members of the same order. Religion, as they see it, has multiple ends. The ultimate supernatural end of religion is the actual God whom we naturally seek to know and to whom we naturally owe devotion, honor, and love. That's the ultimate supernatural end. The proximate mundane ends of religion include what Thomas, in his discussion of, quote, institutions relating to divine matters, calls the formation of human morals. The proper formation of human morals is itself a good end for someone to have, in particular for a ruler to have. And it has political effects. Early modern debates over religion have to do with both sorts of end, the supernatural end, how to conceive of that, how to respond, respond appropriately to that, and also the 
mundane ends, especially those relating to the formation of human morals, a central political topic. It will be crucial as we move forward to keep in mind that these disputes have to do with both sorts of end and that all of the people participating in these debates are concerned with both sorts of end. To a human sinner naturally inclined toward religion, faith brings God's self-revelation in Christ and prescribed sacramental and devotional means for relating oneself justly to the God just re uh, thus revealed. Faith sets right the ultimate end of religious acts by orienting inward acts of devotion and outward acts of worship, evangelizing confession and penance to the true God. It also sets right the matter of religious acts by scripting them as the true God sees fit. The true God, according to these Christians, uh, has preferences about how he uh, ought to be worshiped. So he supplies not only information about himself so people get the object right, but also uh, information about how to do it. So God reveals the path toward right relation as well as the identity of the one to be worshiped. So what then about the mundane ends of religion? Following Thomas, Las Casas held that heathen religion can contribute somewhat to a people's acquisition of moral virtues. A non-Christian magistrate may licitly intend this end, the proper formation of human morals, when promulgating determinate ceremonial practices as means conducive to the harmony and justice of a community. The people participating in such practices can themselves be doing something good relative to the mundane ends of promoting moral virtue and the common good. So even if they are superstitious in some respects, uh, there can be something praiseworthy about what they're doing and something praiseworthy about the forms of character that result from doing it. Without God's help, Thomas thought, the relation between the mundane and supernatural ends of worship is likely to go wrong. Likely to go wrong. He held that God offered the old law, what he meant by um, the revelation in the Hebrew Bible, to the Jews, uh, he, God offered the old law to the Jews of the pre-Christian era in order to guard them from this widespread deficiency of pagan worship that it would get the relation between the mundane and supernatural ends of religion wrong. Las Casas thought of the Indians as analogous to ancient pagans, not Jews. When correcting Oviedo's racist biases about the Indians, Las Casas often compared Indian worship favorably to pagan examples. Indians have governed themselves and inculcated moral virtues well, but not perfectly. They have instituted religious practices partly in order to promote virtue and the common good. That's a proper function of religion. They sometimes get the relation between the mundane ends of religion and its supernatural ends wrong, as well as getting the supernatural ends wrong. But not always, sometimes it's better. So in such cases, it is possible for the mundane ends of worship to be appropriately oriented toward the common good and for mundane and ultimate ends, for mundane and supernatural ends to be ordered properly. It's possible. 
The likelihood decreases whenever rulers have self-interested reasons to declare themselves divinely chosen or to declare themselves worthy of worship, <laughs> to declare themselves deities. Las Casas alludes to Cicero's critique of Caesar's elevation to divine status and to Mark Antony's role as the priest of this oppressor. Tyrants and their henchmen are as likely to use altars, pul pulpits, and priests as they are to use swords, racks, and tax collectors for self-interested and oppressive purposes. Religion's mundane and supernatural ends thus become disordered and its mundane ends become polluted. This is Savonarola's charge against Medici-dominated Florence in the early 1490s. To be fully virtuous, religion needs to be more than a, it needs more than a rectified supernatural end and a proper ordering of supernatural and mundane ends. It also needs mundane ends properly ordered to the moral formation and common wheel of human beings living in a certain place. So for Florentine religion to be purified as Savonarola, as Savonarola sees it, and here he speaks in a language that is very similar to the Puritans a, a little later, it would need the ecclesiastical orientation of true faith, uh, but also the moral orientation of a free republic. Of a free republic. Okay. Why have I been discussing Las Casas and Savonarola rather than their contemporary Martin Luther? Was it not he who initiated the Protestant Reformation and wasn't that the most consequential religious event of this period in Europe? Well, yes, he did and yes, it was. But my topic is an ideal of ethical religion. And Luther was not enamored of that ideal. His contributions uh, to the discourse of religion were m almost entirely indirect. What do I mean by that? Well, his surviving writings use the term religion only half a dozen times, and then only in passing. In other words, using the methodology of these lectures, taking the use of the actual word seriously, he's not a direct participant in the discourse of religion. He doesn't use this language. Religion was barely one of his words. Now, Luther had a great deal to say about faith as a divine gift. He expressed little interest in religion, the moral virtue. Moral virtues for Thomas are built up by, for Thomas Aquinas now, moral virtues are built up, as I said before, by repeated human acts of some kind. Luther did not entirely reject the project of virtue cultivation, but he did regard it as beset by especially dangerous temptations. The category of religion, from his point of view, belongs to a project of ethical formation that can easily tempt people to think that they can save themselves. If you, think religion, if you think of religion as a virtue that you can acquire by engaging in worship and devotion, and think of these acts as helping to set right your relationships with God and your fellow Christians, then, Luther thinks, you might be tempted 
to miss the whole point of the gospel. The gospel's good news is that you are saved not by any kind of moral striving you can engage in, least of all by anything you might try to do in order to set right your relationship with God, but only by faith. And faith is not a moral virtue. It's something given to you by God, infused into you by God. It's the result of God's act, not yours. It is not religion but faith that sets right your relationship with God. Faith is God's gracious gift to you. It saves you from the need you feel in awareness of your sinfulness to make yourself better, to save yourself. The gospel is about something other than religion in Luther's vocabulary, namely faith understood as a divine gift. It is because of his rigorous insistence on this point that Luther made no direct contribution to the discourse of religion. He expressed little interest in the topic of religion. His central theological interest was in the distinct topic of faith. Now, many Protestants, including Calvin, Althusius, Knox, and Milton, to take just several of many examples, did, however, combine something like a Lutheran view of faith as a divine gift with a Ciceronian view of religion. And this put them much closer to Thomas on, uh, on the issues of faith and religion uh, than Luther was. In other words, they were direct contributors to the discourse of religion. They were also more interested in theorizing the moral virtues than Luther was. The idea that modernity is after virtue, that is, that it comes after the period where virtue is the topic cared about, is what you get if you exaggerate the extent and influence of Luther's critique of virtue ethics neglect the continuing influence of Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Livy, and Thomas, and fail to notice how many Protestants remain, remained concerned with cultivating politically significant moral virtues, including religion. Luther's most important indirect contribution to the discourse of religion was, of course, the Reformation itself. The discord unleashed by Luther was primarily about faith. Is the content of the truth revealed in true faith to be found solely in Scripture, or rather, in Scripture as interpreted in the light of reason and an authoritative ecclesial tradition? What then is the revealed truth? Which, if any ecclesial tradition, possesses the authority to interpret this? And how can such questions be answered without either arguing in a circle or appealing to a putative authority that is internally incoherent and manifestly corrupt, which is how Luther thought of the inherited theological and ecclesial tradition. Well, these were Luther's main questions, but they did not, in fact, prevent him from discussing virtues and vices, and nor did they quell debate on what Thomas called institutions relating to divine matters, or the role of those institutions in the formation of human morals or the effects of those institutions on political communities. Debates over those questions, which weren't mainly Luther's questions, uh, continued. Early modern Christians of many stripes debated these matters, and they used the vocabulary of religion, virtue, and vice when doing so. 
thanks to Luther and a revival of Augustine, the resulting literature was rife with warnings about faith's priority, appeals to true faith as a necessary condition of true religion, led to little agreement, however, on, what, uh, on who has true faith. Early moderns who agreed with Thomas on how to distinguish religion from faith were divided over the revealed content of faith. Catholics and Protestants appealed to their own conceptions of faith as a criterion of true religion. And they enforced the resulting religious policies against their opponents. If divinely given faith is needed to orient true religion toward its proper supernatural end and to decide the means to be employed in worship and devotion, disputes over true faith would have to be settled somehow. But how? How might this be done? Elsewhere, I have suggested that the Catholics and Protestants were better at exposing the weaknesses in the reasoning of their opponents than at vindicating their own conceptions of faith against objections. Had the reasons offered by the participants in these disputes in fact achieved a peaceable resolution, no one would have invented the phrase wars of religion as a rubric for this historical period. Those wars surely had something to do with religion, but with religion understood in a highly particular way. And what I've been trying to do is to explain that way. It's not just any old notion of religion, and it's not the notion of religion that's commonplace now. So, the notion of religion that is at stake here is religion as a moral virtue thought to be so politically consequential that it requires official political oversight and enforcement, yet also a virtue in need of perfection by faith understood as a divinely given virtue. All of those components are essential to the combustible mixture. There's another, at least one more component that's essential to the combustible mixture, and that was a concern about freedom understood as security from arbitrary power, a notion we've uh, already encountered in these lectures. So the opposite of such freedom, as I explained last time, is domination. You are dominated according to a tradition stretching back uh, to Cicero, if you are placed or left at someone else's mercy and there is no sound paternalistic justification for this. <laughs> okay. Now we've seen that late medieval and early modern Christians were in, were in the name of freedom or liberty increasingly concerned with securing accountable government and consent of the governed as remedies for domination. That is, as constraints on the arbitrariness of power holders. We've even seen this concern within the Dominican order itself through the institution of councils as part of the governing practice of the order. Okay, but we've also seen this in, in the public realm. Now, suppose a ruler who has power over you is deciding what religion to establish in the territory you are living in. He says that religion is a politically consequential virtue and must be attended to, and you agree. He says that the divine gift of faith is needed to perfect religion's supernatural end to coordinate its supernatural and mundane ends, and to get the vehicles of religious cultivation, expression, and authority right. Again, you agree. 
He then appeals to faith as he conceives of it and reaches conclusions antithetical to faith as you conceive of it. He uses state coercion to force your conformity to the practices and institution, institutions he favors, claiming that you promised when you accepted baptism. <laughs> I can hold you to your promises. He explains that the practices and institutions that you favor are heretical. You have promised to adhere to the true faith and must now be held to your promises. You must conform or pay the consequences of rack, stake, or banishment. When you hear an appeal to divinely given faith in a context of this sort, you have reason to fear that the appeal is arbitrary. You have reason to regard the appeal as arbitrary. One effect of calling such faith divinely given can be to rule out arriving at it as the conclusion of a deliberative process. Divinely given faith then provides the mandatory starting point for deliberating or reasoning. The ruler thinks that he has it, but on his principles, he cannot reason his way to those principles. From your vantage, the ruler's decision is arbitrary. It is indistinguishable from an expression of whim. What you want under such circumstances is to avoid having your own worship and devotion made utterly dependent on someone else's will. You don't want him calling the religious tune however he wishes and punishing you if you don't dance to it. You don't want any matters that are highly important to you to be at his mercy. You yourself don't want to be at his mercy, even if his conception of faith lines up with yours for the time being. You have reason to be worried that the two will come apart, that he'll convert to the other religion uh, in the middle of the night that um, his successor will be of a different religion. You want protection against perturbations of will as well as from uh, his current will. So as long as all of this remains true, you are in a position like a slave's. And this is the problem of religious liberty as largely conceived in this tradition before Hobbes. The problem is not primarily about belief, but rather about what someone might force you to do. Remember, religion is itself mainly about what you would do. It's faith that's about the intellect's assent to something. But now faith claims are being used to justify choices of religion and then political power is being used to enforce something and people who are worrying about freedom as security from arbitrary power begin to put this, uh, the pieces of this picture together and, you know, real trouble. So short of brainwashing, no one can force you to believe something, but threats of punishment can incentivize you to do such things as a vow, a creed, bow to someone, submit to a bishop, baptize an infant, pay for the maintenance of priests, churches, and so forth. Few Christians charged with heresy by their post-Reformation opponents took themselves to be breaking the promises they made when they entered their respective communities. The charge of heresy seemed arbitrary to the accused for the same reason that the underlying appeal to true faith as a criterion of true religion did. Every group forced to submit at the point of a Christian sword has seen the self-designated defenders of faith as oppressors and the mandated forms of religious practice as violations of liberty. 
Now what I want to do is to think a little more about the spectrum of opinions on freedom in this period. Many early modern writers agreed that true religion's first mundane end is a free and flourishing political community. But they actually differed over uh, how a free community would be structured and this played out in different conceptions of freedom. So answers to the question fell on a wide spectrum between Sir Robert Filmer's aptly named book, Patriarcha, and John Milton's ready and easy way to establish a free commonwealth. So all I can do in this section of this lecture is to give you the two extreme points on the spectrum. And then what happens is that there are many intermediate positions depending on uh, exactly what procedures people have in mind in order to increase attention to consent and accountability. Okay. So starting at the right end of the spectrum, Filmer ha held that absolute monarchy alone qualifies as a legitimate form of rule, in part by appeal to scripture he argued that whoever has ultimate power over others in a given territory is sovereign there and authorized by God to rule. The discretionary power exercised by the sovereign is absolute. It is popular election rather than divinely authorized kingship that is arbitrary, according to Filmer. Longing for legal security from a ruler's power is foolhardy and fosters rebellion against God's appointed authorities. Filmer writes, quote, that the greatest liberty in the world is to live under a monarch. So he's right in the face of his opponents. The alternative to such liberty is counterfeit and actually consists in what he calls several degrees of slavery. Catholic schoolmen and Protestant reformers who seek to constrain regal power in the name of popular sovereignty have forgotten, quote, that the desire of liberty, he means as they imagine it, was the cause of the fall of Adam. If we just are at the sovereign's mercy, there is no point in calling for accountable, consensual, legally constrained rule. The sovereign's entitlement to deference from us can be inferred, from Filmer's point of view, from the fact of his power. Because the, how did he get the power? God let him have it. So he, it's the fact that he has the power authorizes him. It does not depend on the consent of anyone but God, who has already determined the distribution of power that makes someone sovereign and others dependent on the sovereign's will. The sovereign is free to authorize or deauthorize institutions of accountability, representation, and worship as he sees fit in accordance with God's will. The monarch is obligated to God to rule wisely and with proper concern for the common good and true faith. But if subjects are, by God's will, dependent on their sovereign's goodwill, whether they like it or not, the Ciceronian ideal of freedom as security from domination by human rulers must simply be discarded. Now you'll notice that Filmer's paternalism in domestic politics resembles the paternalism that Sepulveda deployed on behalf of the conquistadors. The sovereign has a role in the po polity like the father in a family. Children have no role to play in deciding whether to come under a father's authority. They just land there. <laughs> Subjects have no role to play in deciding who is sovereign 
uh, over their country. We are obliged to acknowledge our dependence on everything superior to us in God's created order. We owe pious obedience to our parents, our people, the sovereign, and God. True religion consists in pious and obedient acknowledgement of a given, divinely created order of dependency. So argues Filmer. At the opposite end of the political freedom spectrum, we find John Milton. When the English were in the process of restoring the monarchy, for which so many of them, uh, uh, which so many of them had opposed and shed blood in opposing, Milton argued that kingless republics alone qualify as legitimate. This is an important shift in his work, and it comes just at the moment when the restoration is happening. The very role of a king is oppressive, on his view. So don't be misled that the new king is less tyrannical than the previous one. It's the role that's a problem. His objection applied to any office that comes with the prerogative to call, suspend, or dissolve parliament, or an unrestricted power to veto legislation passed by parliament, or the ability to make other official decisions simply as the office holder pleases, that is, without being constrained by a just legal system, without winning the consent of those ruled, and without providing others with opportunities to influence uh, and contest decisions. Milton saw the connection between freedom from domination and freedom, from, uh, freedom of religion as clearly as any of his contemporaries. Like many Protestants before him, he employed the notion of covenant to restate something like Thomas's integrated vision of the relation between obligations and the common good. And if you think about the notion of covenant for a moment, you can see that it imagines a, a set of interdependent social relations that includes God and others in relations of interdependence. That's a different view from the hierarchical order of one directional dependence that you get from Filmer, about as different from it as you can get. True religion's ultimate and mundane ends mattered to Milton in roughly the way they mattered to the Dominicans. He appealed to divinely given faith and his own reading of scripture when discussing religion's supernatural end, but appealed to a Republican tradition when defending liberty. He borrowed from Cicero and Machiavelli without focusing narrowly on the mundane. Now, at one point in his writings, he says um, something that many people have found puzzling, which is he says that Roman Catholicism is not a religion. And this uh, might seem puzzling if we hadn't already noticed uh, the long tradition of referring to ethical religion as true religion and its semblances as false, that is, not really religion the analogy being the contrast between uh, true science and climate change denial. Catholicism, he thinks, gets the means of true religion wrong because it gets faith wrong. It gets faith wrong because it attributes excessive authority to a tradition corrupted by pride, wealth, and power. But Milton, Milton also had a Republican reason for viewing Catholicism as intolerable, a church opposed to accountable government, a church that sought dominion over England, was simply incapable of inculcating moral or political virtue. That was enough to disqualify the Catholicism of his period, in his mind, as a religion in the positive sense of the term. 
So between Milton uh, and Filmer, there were many intermediate positions on freedom. These acknowledged some need for effective accountability of executive and legislative powers, and thus some need for religious cultivation of courageous, vigilant, wise, self-reliant citizens. The further to the left we move on that spectrum, the stronger the insistence on unbinding religion from domination as well as from tyranny. And this is where we find the early modern precursors, precursors of Wollstonecraft, Walker, Martineau, Garnett, Emerson, Mott, Gandhi, and King, and what we're doing in this lecture series is finding a path to them that helps us understand where they came from and what ideas are at work in their writings. Okay. Section six, disestablishment, natural theology, and a redefinition of freedom, wherein our Gifford lecturer will disclose what happened when the allegedly great separation of religion from politics didn't. <laughs> okay. In other words, um, this is the point in the story where I'm going to try to correct uh, the standard turning point in the secularization of politics narrative, the one that says there's a in the Enlightenment, as a result of the conflicts I've just sketched, something happened called the great separation of religion from politics. I've been saying it seems unlikely that such a separation occurred if we notice the chain of egalitarian um, uh, freedom movements that began in the same period of the, of the Enlightenment and move continuously to the present. Those movements combined uh, religious and secular voices on the side proposing the, the uh, relevant reforms and on the side uh, opposing the reforms. Okay, so what, ha what did happen? What I want to suggest is that a great deal of energy went into reconciling the following three claims, albeit without much success. One, that true religion is a virtue that rulers must take responsibility for cultivating. That's one claim. Two, that true religion must be settled by appeals to divinely given faith. And three, that freedom as security from domination is a paramount political good. Okay. So what I'm suggesting is that lots of people tried to work out a way of holding on to all of these three things. And then a bunch of people decided we've got to ditch at least one of these <laughs> in order to move forward because we're having trouble making them mesh. We have to either adjust or discard at least one of them. So the realization that they don't mesh and may, maybe can't be made to mesh, um, that's the realization that takes us from the wars of religion to the age of enlightenment. But the result of this shift is nothing as simple as a great separation of religion from politics. So all I'm going to do now is to look at very briefly at people who adjusted one or the other of the three claims, okay? And it's very important to keep in mind that people who adjusted one of them mostly didn't adjust the other and that they didn't all agree on which one to give up, okay? If they agreed on all of them and then achieved a simple solution, it might have been a great separation of religion from politics, but it didn't work out that way. The French Republic rejected the first claim that government is responsible for promoting true religion. But the creation of a secular French Republic did not prevent Rousseau, Saint-Simon, Comte, 
Tocqueville or Durkheim from asserting a need for civil religion. Later legislation against religious influence on state affairs failed to prevent the Catholic workers' movement, the personalists, or the intellectuals associated with the journal Esprit, including Paul Ricoeur, from exerting influence on French politics. Theories of uh, political secularization go wrong when they oversimplify the French model and then assume its applicability to countries uh, such as India, South Africa, and the US, which never came under French rule. The US founders, impressed by Locke's argument for a separation of church and magistrate, placed a constitutional ban on an established church. Institutional separation of church and state did not, however, entail separation of religion from politics. These are not the same thing. The founders who passed the First Amendment of the US Constitution, most of them, in their own published writings, warned against divorcing religion completely from politics. They shifted responsibility for cultivating religious virtue to non-governmental institutions. That's not the same thing as divorcing religion from politics. Disestablishment, when combined with freedom of speech, assembly, the press and religious expression created an arena of contestation that has been filled in the US by a succession of religiously motivated political movements. It's a very important to see that that was the effect of the, of the, um, the Bill of Rights. I won't go into the British case here, but it's, it's uh, more like the American case than it's often uh, taken to be because establishment is combined with such a wide view of toleration that a similar effect is achieved. Some Enlightenment thinkers uh, rejected the second claim, the view that disputes over true religion, the political virtue, and they still think of it uh, in these terms, should be settled by appeals to divinely given faith. Locke, William Paley, John Wilkins, and Joseph Priestley sought to place religion on a strictly rational basis. So you hold on to the idea of religion as a politically consequential virtue, and you disconnect it from the problematic notion of divinely given faith, and you try to set religion on a purely rational basis. That's another move. Okay. Locke held that rational belief is strictly proportioned to available evidence, and his followers thought that wide agreement on natural theology would result if this norm were accepted. Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion make the quest for wide agreement uh, on um, religion's supernatural end seem hopeless an ancient form of skeptical argument known as Agrippa's first mode begins by demonstrating that each party to a protracted disagreement is incapable of offering decisive reasons for their respective positions and concludes by recommending diminished confidence in one's commitments if not suspension of belief. Now I'm going to um, abbreviate the next bit of my argument um, for the sake of time, but what I want to bring out uh, before I leave Hume is the idea that taken as a contribution to the discussion of the ethics of belief, it's widely agreed that um, the arguments given by the skeptical character Philo carry enormous power in the final three sections of, of Hume's dialogue. But what I'm suggesting is that um, Hume is about another bit of business, a bit of political business, and what he's suggesting 
is that by allowing the drama of the dialogues to play out as it does, he's attempting to make it look unrealistic to expect the Lockean attempt to secure wide rational agreement on natural theology uh, to work out. In other words, this, uh, that way of responding to the second claim uh, it's just not going to happen. Don't think it's going to happen. This is what it looks like when the argument happens. And at the end of the argument, all of the people still hold the views, <laughs> roughly the views they started with. And uh, uh, the arguments uh, seem, uh, the arguments against one another seem very strong. All right. This brings us, uh, I'm, I'm I want to say just a word about Lord Gifford. When Lord Gifford, in the uh, Gifford bequest for these, these lectures, um, the bequest is evidence that the dispute over natural theology continued, and Lord Gifford clearly rejected Hume's view that true religion is too rare and too lacking in practical implications to qualify as a political virtue. But he also was very familiar with um, attacks on Locke's understanding of what rational belief is. He was not ready to take Locke as the last word on what qualifies as rational belief. He was familiar with Thomas Reed and Emerson and Hegel as rejectors of Locke's epistemology. And this led him to think that a politically beneficial but not necessarily conclusive public discussion of natural theology might be worth having. As he set out the terms for having lectures on this topic, he was basically encouraging a public discussion of natural th theology that would be secular but not secularist, which is to say, um, he didn't want to place as a constraint on Gifford lecturers that they uh, adopt any particular religious view, and he told them not to assume faith claims when making their arguments, which is not to say the same thing as he wanted, to, uh, he wanted uh, Gifford lecturers to be selected who didn't themselves have faith. <laughs> He just wanted a form of discussion of these matters to not take for granted what shouldn't be take for, taken for granted in a, in a community where there's disagreement on these matters. Okay. This brings us finally to the third claim that I mentioned a moment ago. Okay. And that is that Republican freedom or security from uh, arbitrary power is a paramount, a paramount political good. Now here we have to take account of um, the extremely important historical influence of Thomas Hobbes. And I wish I had enough time to give proper attention to this, but in the Leviathan, Hobbes rejected the Cicero-Milton view of freedom, insisting instead that actual absence of interference on our actions is the only sort of freedom worth aiming for. So you are free in the sense of non-interference or non-obstruction just in case you have the power to act and no one is actually obstructing your exercise of that power. This is Hobbes' view. You lose freedom when some external agent's interference renders you incapable of doing what you would otherwise be able to do. And the interference uh, typically consists in physical force that either prevents you from acting or compels you to act in some way. So for Hobbes, you lose your freedom in this sense if you are literally bound by chains and want to do something you are thereby prevented from doing. 
But you also lose your freedom, this is an addition to that point, in a more extended sense, if you have metaphorically bound yourself, that is, obligated yourself by consenting to an enforceable contract. Any sovereign able to enforce the terms of the contract is your master, regardless whether his use of power is constrained in the ways that someone concerned about domination would prefer. Hobbes concludes that there is no important difference in freedom between monarchical and republican regimes as such. All regi regimes obstruct their subjects' freedom to some degree. The degree of obstruction matters, and so do the benefits that obstruction brings. So what's this move doing? Okay. Hobbes was trying, in my view, to lower the political stakes that were raised in his day by revolutionaries. For the tradition of lowered stakes, sometimes called liberalism, the less interference one has to deal with, economically, socially, and religiously, the better. But there is a need for authority. Otherwise, society will be unstable and prone to strife. Individuals have an interest in consenting to a system of government that strikes a tolerable balance between the need for coercively enforced obedience to law and the desire to avoid actual interference. Now, that's a very big change from the notion of freedom that we've mainly been looking at so far in these lectures. Okay. Going back to Milton for a moment, and I'm very close to the end. For Milton, the opposite of freedom is slavery. You surely have reason to object to a monarch who places chains on your ankles and stripes on your back. That's interference, of course. Suppose, however, that a monarch who now seems benevolent is able to treat you however he pleases and has used force to compel you to consent to the arrangements that are in place. Then, Milton said, the relationship is already ill-structured. The power imbalance by itself is a just cause for rebellion. A slave with a kind, non-intrusive master is still a slave. That's Milton's view. And he's offering it after Hobbes has offered his view. When discussing the immorality of slavery two centuries after Milton, Lord Gifford referred to Wilberforce, Clarkson, and as he put it, their gallant fellow laborers in the abolitionist movement as examples of quote unquote, heaven enlightened minds. This phrase chimes with Emerson's view of uh, wholesome reformers. Wilberforce, Clarkson, and Emerson, and this is the point I want to lift up at the end of this lecture, these figures all rejected Hobbes' uh, redefinition of freedom. Now, here, here's what I want, uh, want to say. In most accounts of modern political thought from Hobbes forward, Hobbes' view is treated as the standard view on which variations are worked in mainline political theory. That's mainline academic political theory. And it, what I'm suggesting is that that notion of freedom and the variations on it are not what is happening in egalitarian freedom movements. Those movements retain the notion of freedom that we found in Milton and going back as far as Cicero. That's why I started the, the story of these lectures with the earlier uh, classical works. Milton, um, let's put it this way, the abolitionists and their successors demanded freedom in Milton's sense, 
but they did so for dark-skinned, subjugated, explo exploited poor people as well as for themselves. Milton had no such expansive vision of freedom in mind. He was a freedom fighter, but he was not an egalitarian. So it's abolitionism that is the turning point in the story being told in these lectures. The story I'm telling about freedom and its relation uh, to religious change. The abolitionists wanted particular forms of oppression to end and rejected a politics of lowered stakes. They resisted servitude as such rather than servitude for themselves. They criticized paternalist defenses of slavery. They sought neither to privatize religion nor to tame it, but to emancipate its moral power. And in doing so, they created a model of broad-based activism and critical explanation that subsequent egalitarian freedom movements have emulated. In the next two lectures, I shall bring these characters to center stage, which is where I believe they belong. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for your lecture. I, I was very interested in the claim that uh, mainstream contemporary political theory, or subsequent political theory, really is Hobbist rather than Lockean. So, um, well, there's, uh, in certain respects at least. I wonder if you could explain that. I mean, could one find this, for instance, in John Rawls or Nozick, in, in those political theories that, that emerged in, you know, the, the, at the end of the 70s and in the early 80s that have so hugely influenced our world? It's important to qualify the claim that I was offering in a number of ways. The um, part of what I'm relying on here is uh, an account of the history of uh, varying conceptions of freedom offered by Quentin Skinner. On, and there is a, a, an online version of um, Skinner's uh, sweeping history of modern conceptions of freedom that's, uh, that is easily available. But the, uh, uh, on his view, the shift that occurs in Hobbes leads to, as I said, very many variations. And what that's a shift to is a notion of freedom understood primarily as non-obstruction. And uh, there are many issues that arise in when the variations are worked out according to what qualifies as interference and how notions of coercion are related to that and so on. On Skinner's view, um, it's definitely, on Skinner's view, it's definitely the case that Nozick and Rawls are at the end of that line of development. And Locke, on his view, is somewhat um, ambiguous with respect to that. So Locke has one foot in the Republican side and one foot in the Hobbesian side. Hume is pretty directly a um, an inheritor of the, the Hobbesian contrast, the way of thinking of liberty as, uh, as the ability to act without being interfered with and uh, that needing to be traded off as a value against um, the benefits of uh, politically exercised authority or coercion. Now, here's what I want. The, the, the main revision that I'm making of Skinner's historical view is to say that Skinner, Skinner and 
Philip Pettit as another person who has worked with him to elaborate these views and to draw these distinctions and to chart this history into the, uh, the post-1800 academic context, um, they tend to treat the historical development as simply being a matter of the triumph of what they call the liberal view of freedom. And part of what I am suggesting is that that holds only if you focus almost entirely on academic writers. And that it is unfortunate that our history of, the mod of political thinking in the modern period, when it gets to 1800, tends to neglect the writers outside the academy who are associated with the most significant forms of political change that have happened uh, since 1800. And I'm saying that once you take them into account and then look at the distinctions drawn by Pettit and Skinner, you can see that they fall very squarely on the Milton side of this division between Milton and Hobbes. So that's the major revision in that historical, I, I'm saying that after 1800, the story is more complicated and very importantly so. It's not the case that the so-called liberal what I'm calling the politics of lowered stakes dominates uh, the entire political culture. George. Thank you, thank you sir. Uh, but this lecture has raised a lot of questions for me with respect to my research. And, uh, but this question has to do with uh, ethical religion and moral virtue. Specifically in a context in relation to prison and prisoners and prison policies. Uh, take for instance in the US and the UK, you have a shift towards what is called generic religion in prisons and uh, religious neutrality, where the focus on the divine or individual particular religion is sort of uh, undermined or uh, uh, discarded simply to reach, for prison chaplains to reach every prisoner, sort of. And, uh, but yet instead you've got prisoners who want to identify with their particular religion. My question then is, in, in that particular context where the notion of the divine, the notion of, uh, where it becomes very difficult to uh, pursue supernatural ends or moral virtue, how can these be cultivated? What would Aquinas say in that particular context, if at all you have political coercion say you cannot identify with any particular religion and the notion of supernatural ends is undermined? So I, uh, I'm not sure what Aquinas would say, but let me say this. Um, the, there's a, a good deal of, historical work has been done and is being, doing, is being done now on governmental and legal uses of the term religion in connection with uh, prisons and various other um, governmental agencies, including um, the armed forces uh, and uh, so forth. Part of what I'm saying is that the way the term religion is used in those contexts, in those governmental contexts, which is now increasingly well understood as washing out the notion of religion in a way that treats it in a very um, suspicious and generic way in order to deal with, uh, to some extent, captive populations and apply, in the US context, First Amendment law and case law to the, re the relevant matters. Part of what I want to say is that the notion of religion developed in those contexts is not the same notion of religion to which um, the abolitionists, the civil rights movement, 
advocates, feminists in the 1890s and so on were appealing. So early in this lecture series when I sketched the ambiguities surrounding the term religion, I started by treating the idea, uh, trying to bring out the extent to which religion can refer to many different things. And uh, part of what, we're, what I'm trying to chart in this uh, lecture series is, is a particular tradition's development of the notion and the criteria for applying the term and then the implications that follow from it. And that's taking religion to be an ethical ideal and so on. So that's not the way the governmental institutions are employing the term when applying First Amendment law. So part of what we have to do to get further in this matter is just to recognize the semantic complexity of this, of this terminology and how many different things have been done with it. The same applies to the notion of freedom. Just how many different conceptions of freedom are at play and not to be caught up, uh, not to be tripped up by the fairly radical pluralosity of the concept. Thank you. Uh, perhaps this question, uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, really enjoyed it. Perhaps this is kind of jumping the gun. Um, but I was curious, uh, in particular, Milton's conception of freedom and how it would relate to um, how, how we can have social justice movements that don't, in and of themselves, take away freedom. Um, so if this idea that a king is naturally uh, oppressive, so uh, what sort of obligations do we have to preserve while fighting for freedom? so that we don't take away freedom based upon our, I guess, arbitrary choice. I guess to put it in a kind of culturally relevant term, is, is Batman oppressive? <laughs> um, <laughs> is, is this idea of vigilante justice. You know, what is, uh, you know, what is, what is just is not lawful, but then who determines that and can an individual act um, in such a means? So, kind of broad question, but yeah. The egalitarian freedom movements that I've been listing um, are all of them concerned with achieving reforms within uh, legal structures or uh, in constituting new legal structures. And they are inheritors of a very long tradition that takes freedom to be essentially a matter, uh, something that is made possible only within legal constitutional structures that can secure people against domination. No law, no such security. The, the question then becomes how with uh, how in particular settings where particular sorts of social good are at issue, um, can the right structures be uh, developed so that um, the people affected by the structures and by the use of power within those structures can have uh, sufficient say to be able to view those structures as somewhat expressive of their own will and not merely as alien forces that are, um, uh, that are uh, holding power over them. That's the issue. Now the issue comes up again within, and this goes to your Batman question, it comes up again within the social movements themselves. And part of what I want to do uh, in, uh, in this lecture series is to get people thinking about how the social structure of the relevant political movements itself already embodies the central issues with respect to domination and freedom. So let's think about a number of different cases just to make it more concrete. On the one hand, you have Leninism as a revolutionary movement that is 
and I'll discuss Leninism a bit in subsequent lectures, just as a contrasting case to the uh, movements that I'm highlighting. What you have is a, a movement led by a professionalized avant-garde, okay, which has a relation that's, in my view, pretty dominating over the rank and file of the movement itself. Okay. Um, at the opposite end of the spectrum, you have something like the Occupy movement, which has no structure at all and takes pride in its original manifestation in at least several American cities in being leaderless. Early feminism, uh, the early uh, sort of 1960s feminism, early in that sense, uh, was largely structuralist. Joe Freeman, a very important feminist thinker, one of my favorite feminist thinkers, um, wrote a, a, an extremely influential arc, article called The Tyranny of Structuralistness which is to, what she was drawing attention to was insufficient structure actually allows the power relations within a movement to be unnoticed and unaccounted for. Well, if we look at the civil rights movement, the abolitionist movement, and so on, what we see in contrast to these two positions at the ends of the spectrum, structuralistness on the one hand and um, avant-garde dominating rank and file, what we, what we see is developments of, form of forms of leadership within the movements in which the leaders are held accountable to the rank and file and in which practices of accountability create relations of representation within movements that allow, well, are they perfect? No. Ella Baker had strong and legitimate criticisms to make of Martin Luther King Jr. for not recognizing the significance of the role of female organizers in the movement, organizers like Ella Baker herself and Septima Clark, two of the most important civil rights organizers and two uh, heroes of the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement. The Black Lives Matter interest in those figures is an interest in accountable leadership and in developing movements that themselves have, the, themselves exhibit the sort of change they are calling for and do so in a way that allows uh, uh, domination within the movement to be avoided. Well, if you, there are also questions about the employment of means toward the ends being sought in, egal in egalitarian freedom movements, and that's what I've just discussed is organizational means, but there are also means relating to tactics that have to be discussed. And here, if we go back to the Leninist case, it's not accidental in my view that uh, a Marxist-Leninist movement produced in Russia, and in the Soviet Union rather, um, a dictatorship of the proletariat that was never overcome. Domination within a movement tends to duplicate itself if the movement wins. And this ties in with, with what, forms of, um, what forms of violence are considered, if any, are considered acceptable by uh, the movement involved. Um, these are all concerns that came to the forefront within uh, the movements that I've been highlighting. I hope that is concrete enough to give some suitable response to a question about Batman. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we've drawn to the end of our time, and we clearly have um, a great deal more to come next week, which I'm really looking forward to. So please, would you um, help me in joining, join with me in thanking Professor Stout?